like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Sue Ozdemir, who I've gotten the pleasure of knowing over the last year. She's the CEO of XRO Technologies and an industry expert with more than two decades of accomplishments throughout the electric motor industry, including eight years at General Electric, and I give it to Sue. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'll just give you a little bit about myself. I joined XRO about a year ago now. Uh, prior to joining XRO, I was the CEO of GE Small Industrial Motors, a Wolong company, and I had worked my way through I grew up in the electric motor business my parents owned an electric motor repair shop growing up so I could fix a motor when I was pretty young um, from there I went to work for WEG Electric which is one of the top industrial motor manufacturers out of Brazil and then on to GE where I worked my way up through a series of promotions taking me down to Houston Texas as a CEO of their small industrial motor business and then in late 2017 early 2018 I led the acquisition of our business to Wolong Electric who has a 10 year branding agreement and created a business unit called Wolong Industri uh, GE Industrial Motors, a Wolong company. And I was the CEO of that company globally when EXO recruited me last year. EXO has phenomenal technology that is a step change in power electronics. What we really do is control electric motors intelligently through the power electronics. So we have created a new type of inverter that allows a single motor to now have two separate torque profiles one that optimizes that low end speed and one that optimizes that high end performance. So essentially electric gearing through the motor. Uh, we use physics of electric motors called coil switching and we've applied it to the 21st century intelligently. And what we're really doing is, you know, finding a new way to look at energy consumption. While we're focused on the mobility industry, I think that what we're able to do is help accelerate commercial vehicles, trucks and buses, as we offer them the opportunity to increase the performance of the vehicle, climb a hill and degrade less battery. So with utilization of our product, what will happen is these vehicles will now be able to go farther on a single charge or do an extra lap if they're a performance vehicle, maybe pull extra torque or load if it's a garbage truck or a municipal vehicle. So it's a step change. We are first to market, we're a first mover in what we're developing. We have different operational applications. Our first one was released with Motorino. And actually this morning, Robert, we put out our press release with customer validation of that first project. The validation was a little bit delayed with COVID. Um, he has a retail store, so it took us a little bit longer, but we're super proud of that validation that will help us to now start penetrating the two and three wheel market segment. And then our next uh, pilot will go out in November, which will be for the four, four wheel passenger vehicle. And so now automotive OEMs, instead of using one motor in the front and one in the back and maybe some gearboxes, they'll be able to reduce those components utilizing our integrated inverter, which allows them that opportunity to gear, take advantage of torque and speed all within a single motor. Sorry, I'm still and then, muted. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> I, I just took a look. I wanted to make sure I wasn't enough time. And then from a commercialization yeah, right. perspective, um, about a year ago when I joined, I made a commitment that our company would strive to enter into eight commercial deals. As a tech company, I wanted to really position ourselves with operational applications. So these deals were key to proving the versatility and scalability of our technology. So we, saw, we started with a two-wheel bike, we moved into a snowmobile, an electric boat, um, an electric snowmobile, an agricultural cedar, a fleet delivery van, and a motor manufacturer. So eight completely different segments all within the mobility industry. And we were very proud. We, we finished those eight deals are all engaged. We're in development in all eight of those deals. And over the next six to 12 months, we'll be producing different platforms for the technology that will allow us to just scale into larger partnerships in the coming year. Um, from a fundraising perspective, um, we've done very well. We have a very strong bank account right now. We just finished a raise in uh, July, which was backed by Gravitas Investment Bank here in Canada. And we were out raising uh, $5 million. We were hugely oversubscribed and we closed at $8 million. Um, so it gives us enough runway through the end of next year, the ability to finish our facility here in Calgary. Our grand opening is the 20th. Um, team's working hard to get all our lab facility up. We've taken our test facility up to five times the size that we had previously with the new funds. And we've doubled our full-time employees uh, from eight up until uh, 20 employees now here in Calgary. 
Um, so we feel like we're very well positioned. We're super optimistic about what the future holds for us. And um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. As, as, we, as we start to get into it, really what we're focused on too is helping a lot of the industry and companies target and accomplish their net zero targets. You know, we've focused a lot on general emissions, but as we look to that kind of third level where you're looking at fleet trucks, even in smaller fleets can make a huge impact on how those companies meet net zero, how sustainable we are and how quickly we accelerate to that type of uh, transition to electric vehicles. So we hope to be the market leader for that as we continue to position ourselves and our brand. So that's all great news, Sue. Uh, I do want to give a disclosure to everyone. Uh, I've known the company for a long time and I am a small shareholder, so great performance by the stock. Um, but that actually leads me to a question that I wanted to bring up because we've had a few other Canadian companies here, um, worked with lots of early stage companies. You mentioned your private raise of, of oversubscribe, which is great news. But a lot of Canadian companies have accessed the public uh, markets. Can you maybe discuss how that's worked for you um, at XRO and how that's kind of both impacted capital raising or how that uh, how that's worked because that's not usually an option or maybe it's a newer option again what's old is new for SPACs and things like that in the market but can you speak to that a little bit? Um, we haven't done a lot with that so so our first the first raise that we did um, just when we met last actually Robert was a private placement that we did did in house our last raise was actually through Gravitas which was an investment bank that took the lead for us that's mm -hmm. all we've done from the Canadian market side um, we do just spend a lot of time with awareness for public and retail um, a lot especially since we went into COVID um, what we really try to do is just build our credibility in the market so we we go in for the long time we, we, we meet with a lot of people regularly through our IR team, myself and our finance um, CFO, and we just keep continuing to repeat that um, over, over the months. And so when we actually go out to raise, it's probably something we've been working on for over six months. And I, and I do think that's something that um, has really, really helped us because we, we, we don't get down to fumes. We, we are planning it well in advance to when we do it. And we're sharing our story, like you said, we met many times um, <laughs> before our last, I think you were the last visit I did before COVID hit, uh, March 9th. Um, so I think, I think that's been really, really important for us in the public markets is just raising awareness to ourselves. We do, we've just started some social media campaigns and, and, and different campaigns to build our brand awareness, but we do just work really, really hard with a lot of the family office networks and smaller boutique institutions to share our story from a very initial standpoint, like beyond a non-deal show, they're not even, they're just listen to what we're doing. This is what we're about. I think uh, you coined the term that I have stolen, and I give you credit for, of socializing uh, investors in your network. That's which, the one. Yeah, and, and I think that's a tremendous work. Um, that actually leads to another question of uh, the timing and, and maybe uh, kudos to you and what you're able to do. Have you let, what, can you tell us a little bit more about you came to XRO basically when they were almost out of money and said, I'm still taking this job. Can you give us a little <laughs> insight on how to make that work? Cause you know, you guys are doing great now. So right. some more um, on that. You know, I, I've been very blessed in that sense. I, I, I think that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visionary, but I'm not a risk taker in general. So definitely was probably one of the biggest risks I've taken in my life. I come from a corporate background where I tend to be much more structured, but I really believe that the technology could take off and I really believed in our board of directors and their commitment to helping the company to be able to raise. So yes, when I joined, we were definitely on fumes. Mm -hmm. um, my first day at XRO was a road show. Um, it was also my first road show. Um, and we traveled for five days through five different cities. Um, and, and Mark, our, our current chairman, was instrumental in helping us to raise. And he had been socializing the XRO story himself for months. So I think it was kind of the start. And, and from that point, that was our first race since I've joined. We've done three since I've been on board. Um, we try to protect our shares as much as we possibly can. So we were out raising, you know, around a million dollars. Uh, we closed that one at 1.8, um, hit a few more milestones, continued to socialize. We did another private placement in February. We were out raising 3 million. We closed 4.3. Um, again, continued to build. Um, our, first, our first raise was at just over 30 cents, our second raise, um, uh, sorry, our first raise at 27, our second raise was at 35, and our, our most recent raise was at 70. Um, so we continued to build up our value, continued to just keep socializing it, 
telling the story and just working hard to execute as best as we can. And, and when we can't, we, we, we share it. We don't hide it. We don't try to cover it. If we've missed something, we own it. We, we try to be as proactive as we can about that. Well, I think that's probably one of the benefits of your corporate background from you know, a place like GE or places that were large and publicly traded, knowing some of those things to watch out for. Uh, but a question from Ibrahim uh, Ihari was expanding on the concept of socializing investors, um, maybe because while you have to walk a little bit different line because you have a publicly listed stock, I think it's something that applies for any early stage company, uh, really. So could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I would say um, one of the key things I have learned is as hard as it may be set two or three major milestones and they don't need to be specific, but they, they also need to be material. And I think that's really key. Um, and material to the market is maybe different to different stakeholders, right? Material to your employees, material to your customers, material to the marketplaces is different things. So we like to say things that bring our company to the next level. So for us as a tech company, as we develop these different platforms, that's pretty material. As we validate through a customer, that's material. Set one or two, make that six month goal even, and go out and talk to your investment profile, whoever you're targeting, whether that's family offices or institutions or just the retail market, find a way to tell your story um, in a way that's understandable is, an, is another key thing. Cause that was something that we really struggled with for our first few months is, it, you know, it's, it's a difficult concept, what we do, how we do it. And we've just put an enormous amount in, of work into our story and how we impact the, the world, how we can change and accelerate electrification. We've just put a lot of effort into that. Uh, that's really helpful. Um, and we've got a few minutes left. So one thing that maybe I wanted to pivot for, towards as you brought it up um, on operations and really and, and hitting those kind of things because I think that's one of the other challenges for an early stage company of managing that and especially in a COVID environment and supply chain disruptions, things like that. So uh, just any anything that you've seen uh, about moving from a large corporate environment to, to a smaller company and, and some thoughts on, on operational execution for, for both storytelling and for you know getting investor milestones. Yeah, that one's been that one's been a really good lesson for me. Um, so I think the key thing is, mo no matter what role you're in, it matters. But more so in a small organization, um, as you're building up, especially in the public markets, who you surround yourself with, I think is key. Uh, you know, you can't do it. You can't do it by yourself. I'm not building this by myself. It's it's thanks to lots of people, uh, both employees and consultants and advisors and people that surround me. Um, professionally and personally that have helped to do that. So I think from a supply chain perspective, especially with COVID, I think you know, surrounding yourself with people that are very experienced in that area will really help you to kind of think creatively and outside of the box and keep going because the world is like this, but our expectations as executive leaders is still that we're gonna execute. It's not, I can't execute, you know, I've heard a lot lately, don't use, you know, don't use COVID as an excuse. So our expectation is still to deliver. So I think surrounding, if you find yourself in an area like I did where, hey, maybe I don't know enough about supply chain because you're right, I came from GE, we had phenomenal supply chain. So we brought on a VP of supply chain for ourselves to help us to build. I think make those bigger steps. Um, it puts a little bit more work on yourself and maybe other things but make those big steps to surround yourself with people that can complement your own skills. That, that's really the team that surrounds you, I think, is just as important as what you're selling, what you're creating. All right, that's great. Do you have any parting thoughts? So, we'll, you know, Peter wants us to stay right on time. So we're, we've got about a minute left. So any other last thoughts? And uh, again, appreciate you uh, joining us and glad things are going well at, at Xro. No, thank you very, very much. Please keep an eye on us. You can see us on our website at www.xro.com.